Hello and welcome to another episode of Underworld Diary. If you have been enjoying the stories told on this channel, feel free to hit the like and subscribe buttons below to help the channel grow. In today's episode, we are going to take a look at one of the most ambitious gangsters we have ever looked at, Carmine Galanti. A man reputed as a ruthless enforcer, Galanti would not follow the rules set in place by the Mafia or its ruling commission. Driven by his personal goal of power and ambition Galanti, would violently take what he wanted, ignoring any of the consequences that would come his way. Able to unofficially become the boss of the Bonanno family, Galanti would start a civil war within the family, that had overarching effects on the family that carried over for years. However, Galanti's violent rise would be mimicked by his extremely violent downfall, creating a lasting impact and a lasting image in organized crime history. Carmine Galanti was born in February 1910, in New York City. Galanti grew up in a predominantly Italian-American section of Brooklyn, where he quickly found himself getting into trouble. Galanti was said to have engaged in criminal activity as early as the age of 10, seen committing petty crimes in the neighborhood. Continuing this criminal activity, Galanti would be enrolled in a reformatory school before reaching his teenage years. This school wouldn't have the intended effects, as Galanti would continue to find himself in trouble over this time. By the time he made it to the seventh grade, Galanti would determine that school wasn't for him and would drop out. Not going to school, Galanti would continue committing small crimes in the neighborhood, and would allegedly join a small street gang in his neighborhood. By the time he reached his 16th birthday, Galanti would have a growing criminal rap sheet, including serious charges of assault and robbery that occurred in 1926. These charges would see the young Galanti being sent to prison to serve a two-year sentence. Serving this time before being a legal adult would only further Galanti's criminal ventures, as coming out of prison he would begin associating with prominent organized crime members who were beginning to profit massively from prohibition. Acting as an enforcer during this time, Galanti would begin to build a reputation for himself with powerful organized crime members throughout New York. While aiding these members in their illicit business ventures, Galanti would also hold legitimate jobs at a fishery and a flower shop. However, both his illicit business and legitimate business would come to an abrupt halt in 1930 when he found himself in two extremely public shootings. The first shooting occurred in 1930 when Galanti and a crew allegedly attempted to rob a payroll delivery that was being guarded by a police officer. During this robbery, the police officer, Walter Decasilia, would be fatally wounded, with the crew running off without grabbing the money. The killing of a police officer would carry major public outcry but would not see anyone indicted due to lack of evidence. Following the shooting of a police officer, Galanti would allegedly be a part of another crew who attempted to hijack a truck. Galanti would allegedly be confronted by a police officer named Joseph Minahan. This confrontation would escalate into a shootout between the crew and the officer, resulting in the police officer being wounded. For his involvement in this robbery, Galanti would plead guilty, receiving a 12-year prison sentence. Serving roughly eight years of this prison sentence, Galanti was paroled in May of 1939. Galanti, having spent 10 of his last 29 years in jail, doubled down on the path he was on, choosing to increase his violence in the years to come. Going into the 1940s, Galanti began associating with the extremely powerful mafioso Vito Genovese. It has been reported that Galanti carried out hits on behalf of Genovese during this time, with the FBI even claiming that he was involved in up to 80 murders. One of the alleged murders that Galanti was named the prime suspect in was the murder of anti-fascism newspaper reporter Carlos Tresca. This murder was covered more in depth in the Vito Genovese video, which alleged it was ordered by Genovese to curry favor with Italian politicians. Again not facing charges for this murder, Galanti continued to commit violent acts in an attempt to climb the ranks of organized crime. After a quick time in jail for a parole violation, Galanti began to align himself with the Bonanno family going into the 1950s. Becoming close to the then boss of the family, Joseph Bonanno, Galanti gained major sway within the family. His importance was truly seen in 1953 when Joseph Bonanno allegedly personally sent Galanti to Montreal, Quebec, Canada, in order to have him set up rackets in the area. One of these rackets that Galanti was instrumental in building up over this time was the heroin trafficking operation the Bonanno family was alleged to control. This operation saw heroin being shipped to the ports of Montreal, where it was received and repackaged before being sent to the US for sale. This brought in tens of millions for the family, making Galanti extremely wealthy. This was combined with the gambling operations Galanti was alleged to operate in the region. 
successfully setting up these massively lucrative businesses, Galanti aimed to stay and continue to grow his wealth. However, in 1956, the Canadian government deported Galanti back to the US. Despite the quick deportation, Galanti still earned major respect within the Bonanno family due to his efforts in Canada, allegedly becoming the consigliere of the family in 1957. Back in the US, Galanti allegedly continued to develop his heroin trafficking operation, enlisting the help of mafia members in both Italy and the US. This continued to bring in millions for the family but also attracted law enforcement attention. This attention led to Galanti being indicted on drug conspiracy charges in 1958. Galanti, not looking to face more prison time, attempted to go on the run to avoid these charges. However, he was eventually caught in 1959, where he was detained before posting $100,000 bail. Galanti then went to trial in 1960, facing two different trials for narcotics trafficking. The first of these trials saw him receive only a 20-day sentence, while the second saw him served with the much harsher sentence of 20 years in prison. Galanti was paroled from prison in 1974, after serving roughly 12 years of his prison sentence. Coming back to the streets after over a decade away, Galanti found himself in a family very different from how he left it. The new boss of the family was a reputed mobster named Philip Rusty Rostelli, who eventually came to power after the previous boss, Joe Bonanno, was exiled from the Mafia for planning to take over the Mafia completely by killing the other bosses on the commission. With his boss and longtime mentor out of the picture, Galanti, once the official consigliere of the family, found himself in a position of unknown power upon returning to the streets. Despite being out of the family's operations for decades, Galanti picked up right where he left off, allegedly operating multiple different rackets, including the heroin trafficking operation that sent him to prison in the first place. While regaining his footing, Galanti saw an opportunity to seize power in 1976. That year, Philip Rostelli was arrested on extortion charges and sent to prison for six years. With the boss gone, a leadership vacuum in the Bonanno family emerged, leading to Galanti quickly taking this spot, unofficially dubbing himself the new boss of the family. This move was said to split the Bonanno family, as many did not trust Galanti in this position. This divide caused tension in the family but didn't slow down the ambitious Galanti. Taking over the top seat, Galanti looked to expand his family's operations, especially concerning the drug trafficking operation. With other members of the five families holding key positions in the overall operation, Galanti sought to force them out to have himself and his family hold complete control. This goal of taking over caused major friction with the Gambino family, specifically, who were viewed as one of the most powerful families at the time. Galanti, not backing down, broke one of the Mafia's biggest rules by allegedly ordering the unsanctioned murders of eight members and associates of the Gambino family. Ordering these killings was seen as going too far by most in the Mafia, viewing Galanti as greedy, power-hungry, and ruthless. Dissatisfaction also began to grow within his own family, as members started visiting Rastelli in prison, informing him about Galanti's actions. One of these members was allegedly longtime Rastelli loyalist and future boss Joe Messino. Upon learning of Galanti's violent and greedy actions, Rastelli sent word to the Mafia's commission to request permission to eliminate Galanti. After doing a brief stint in prison for a parole violation, Galanti was back on the street in 1979, where he continued his rapid expansion of the Bonanno family in the drug trade. Despite immense success during this time, Galanti did not fully see the extent of distrust within the family. Still having support from powerful members, Galanti continued with business as usual. On July 12, 1979, Galanti alongside his bodyguards Baldassari Amato and Cesare Bonventra headed to an Italian restaurant in the Bushwick area of Brooklyn. Along with his bodyguards, Galanti was said to be joined by Bonanno capo Leonard Coppola as well as the owner of the restaurant, Giuseppe Turano. After finishing their meal, Galanti lit a cigar as the table continued to discuss business. However, before they could finish the conversation, three gunmen wearing ski masks rushed out onto the balcony where they were sitting. The three gunmen quickly opened fire, instantly killing Galanti, Turano, and Coppola. Galanti infamously fell to the floor with his lit cigar still in his mouth, creating one of the most publicized images in Mafia history. However, in the shootout, Galanti's bodyguards Amato and Bonventura escaped completely unharmed. It has also been reported that they left in the same car as the shooters, leading many to conclude that they were part of this murder plot. The only person to stand trial for this murder was Anthony Indelicato in 1987, when he was found guilty and sentenced to 40 years in prison. 
However, with such a high-profile murder, many other powerful Mafia members were suspected to be involved, including names such as Sonny Black Napolitano and Joe Messino. However, no formal charges were brought their way. Following this murder, the Bonanno family experienced years of turmoil before Messino took control, leading to one of the most violent times the Bonanno family ever saw. With Galanti's death representing a forgotten era, his ambition and greed serve as an often ignored warning of the dangers of power-hungry mobsters who followed him. Thank you for watching another episode of Underworld Diary. If you enjoy the stories told on the channel, feel free to hit the like and subscribe button to help the channel grow. If there are any topics you would like to see covered in future videos, feel free to leave a comment down below, if not, I will see you next time with another story from the Underworld.